Hi, I'm Catherine Clark. Welcome to Beyond Politics. Nova Scotia NDP MP Megan Leslie never set out to become a member of Parliament. Instead, she was an activist with a legal background. But when she was approached to run for former NDP leader Alexa McDonough's Halifax seat, she certainly didn't hesitate, and she brings a fresh perspective to the halls of Parliament. She joins me now to talk all about life beyond politics. Megan Leslie, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Now, you are um, a rookie MP, and you um, have been in Ottawa, you know, several months now. How's it been? Um, <laughs> it's been so many things. It's been exhilarating. It's been devastating. It's been really, really hard. It's been joyous. Every emotion you can think of, I've, I've pretty much gone through in the past seven months. I will be really honest with people when, when they ask me what's it like. The first five months were incredibly difficult. Um, and, I, and I tell people, you know, when you start a new job, you're a, an assistant something, you're a deputy something, you have a mentor who brings you through and does a bit of an orientation. Well, when you're elected, the very next day you are the MP. The very next day you are representing your constituents. And they are demanding certain things of you. Um, and rightfully so. Right, you don't you don't get to do it as a trial run, but you just are thrown in feet first, and it's such a steep learning curve, and there's so much to process about um, the House of Commons, about what your role is as a leader in your community, about what the expectations are of your community and, and the expectations of your party. It, it was really really difficult, uh, but a funny thing happened about. Five months in, I, it was a Monday. I remember it was a Monday, and I went home. My, my partner lives here with me, and uh, and I said, I had a really good time today. I, I had, it was fun. I had a good day, and since then, I've been really enjoying my job. Uh, I will say that I never, you know, in those five months that I found so difficult, I never once regretted my decision. You didn't, eh? Not you didn't once. Say, oh my God, what have I done? I said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said that every day. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I never regretted. I never thought I need to get out of this. Okay. Uh, I did often think, oh my God, what have I done? Uh, but it felt like it was very uh, useful work, very meaningful work. It was work that needed to be done and I was proud to be doing it. But I didn't enjoy it. But now I enjoy it. At, um, was there anyone that you turned to for help? I mean, you talked about your partner and obviously you could have, I'm sure you said, you shared things with him like, yeah. this is really not fun. I am not finding <laughs> yeah. this fun. Yeah. But did you talk to anyone else about it? Yeah. Well, my caucus mates are wonderful, and especially we have a women's caucus within the NDP, and 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 they're wonderful. They're so supportive and and nurturing within within the the boundaries of how they can be because they're busy being MPs. Mm -hmm. So I could you know sit down with Jean Crowder, my colleague from out in BC, and say, Jean, my gosh, this thing. How do I deal with this thing? And Oh, Megan, well, here's what I've seen and here's what some other people have done. But honestly, you're doing that in little snippets of time in the margins, in between running to the next thing or, or, or processing the next thing. Right. So, so I definitely turned to my colleagues and they were wonderful and they were supportive. But their, their time's limited as well because they are also elected officials doing the same thing, you know, working hard, struggling sometimes to do the same things that you're doing. Had you always wanted to be an MP? No. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I'm a political activist. I'm an, uh, a community activist, primarily on poverty issues, uh, also environmental issues. And, and you're a lawyer. I, I'm not a lawyer, but I have a law degree. Right. And the reason I ran, same reason why I went to law school. I'm a community activist, and I was engaged uh, with activism with community in certain ways, and I thought, well, what am I good at? At the time, I thought, well, I'm good at school. I did well in university, so maybe I'll go back to school. What could I do in school that would help me be a different kind of activist? And I decided on law school. I thought law would be a really valuable uh, tool for social change. I went not intending to be a lawyer. I went to get the degree. And I'm very happy with the degree. I'm very happy with what I learned. So then I was a, a legal community activist. and. There are many, many reasons why I ran, uh, which I, I can go into, but, but one of the biggest was 
me thinking about this could be a new way for me to be an activist. This could be a way for me to be a different kind of activist. Uh, if I have certain skills of being able to mobilize community and do community development, if I have certain skills of public speaking or, or of political analysis, then maybe if the voters believe that as well, then maybe I can bring that activism to the House of Commons. Why is it so important to you to be an activist? Because there, there is a lot of inequality in our country and in our world. There's economic inequality, um, there's racial and gender inequality, and I don't like it. You know, it's quite simple. <laughs> I don't think that that is where we should be. I believe in, in social and economic rights. I also believe in government very much. I'm a social democrat. I believe in a government that takes care of its people, a government that takes care of its environment, that educates us, that nurtures us. And I see right now, in particular, a government that is eliminating itself, cutting what it does, cutting back the roles that it has. And that's, that's really the opposite of what I want to see for Canada or what I want to see for any country or for any, any communities. Um, so it's important for me to demand of government to take those leadership roles and to take care of its citizens. Uh, whether you do it by going to a protest with a placard, there's one outside right now and building a couple doors down, or whether you do it by doing test cases in court and saying, these laws are, are not right under the charter, these laws violate our rights, or whether you do it by actually um, getting into, becoming an elected official and, and trying to do it from this end. It's all part of the same uh, same process towards the same end. And I will tell you, since I've become elected, I've, I've always known how important it is for civil society to engage on issues. Now that I'm elected, I could stand up in the House of Commons about issue X and say, this is the way it should be, this is the way it should be. I could do that till I'm blue in the face, and it does not matter one bit unless there are also people in civil society saying the same thing as me. It's incredible how powerless elected officials are unless there's community demanding the same things, wanting the same things. Um, and it's, that's been a really interesting thing for me to learn. And, <clears throat> pardon me, it also reinforces for me how much I think elected officials need to work with community and do community development and do education about issues. This is the issue with X. This is how I see it. How do you see it? Well, if you agree with me, how do we change that? How do we work together? What were you like as a kid? <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> I was incredibly, incredibly shy. Were you really? Yes. Oh my I was, goodness. Um, I was debilitatingly shy. Really? Yeah. Yeah, very all much. All through your childhood? Yes, all through my childhood. Wow. Like getting sick shy if I had to do something public. Oh, that's um, tough. Yeah, yeah. What do you think it was? What made you so shy? Do you know? Was it just... Oh, I'm sure psychologists could give all kinds of reasons. <laughs> I was an only child, yeah. um, so I didn't have other kids to interact with. I knew how to interact with adults. Right. Um, I... And you grew up in, I grew up in a small hard rock mining town in northern Ontario. Yeah. Um, and in a small family. Right. We didn't have lots of big boisterous family dinners or cousins coming over or anything like that. And you were raised, your mom? My was, mom raised me, was a single yeah. mom growing up. And your grandparents, I and, guess. Yeah, my grandparents were very involved in my upbringing, were, were Finnish. Um, my mom is a, a newcomer from Finland along with my grandparents. Um, and when you're in this little town too, you don't have a great breadth of world experience. You don't have a very uh, broad world view. You just kind of know how to get from your house to your school or your house to your work. And I'd Back. never, yeah, I'd never done anything or seen things or understood the world other than my street where I lived. Um, I don't know why I was so shy. I just was and it was was it tough? Was it a, do you remember childhood as being difficult because of that? I think probably no more difficult than anybody else's right. childhood. You know, there are um, great memories that we all have and then there are painful memories that we yeah. all have. So yeah. how did this debilitatingly shy kid <laughs> go into active politics where you're on a stage all the time? You're, yeah. Whether you're 
here and having to stand up in the house or in committee work or whether you're at home um, you know in a debate or even buying groceries you're <laughs> on it's funny the groceries thing is the only thing I still struggle with um, <laughs> honest to goodness yeah. in grade 9 my friend Judith and I we were you know I didn't have a whole lot of friends in grade 9 and uh, we would hang out together and we were not the party girls we were you know the I, I can't imagine <laughs> being a party girl no, and that's not a bad thing <laughs> thank you <laughs> And uh, in, in grade 10, the beginning of grade 10, the grade 9 yearbook comes out. Okay. And I'd never had a yearbook before because you don't have it in elementary school. So in the beginning of grade 10, the grade 9 yearbook came out. I was very excited. So we've got our yearbooks and everybody's getting everybody else to sign them. We didn't know too many people, so we didn't have very many we signatures. Signed we signed each other. We signed each other. And we were looking through it. And I don't remember if we were at her house or my house, but we were looking through it. And, and there was this realization looking at these pictures, all these kids were having fun. <laughs> really? You were yeah. actually remember consciously yes. having that memory? Wow. Yes, and uh, they were having fun and they were involved in all these different things and there were these different clubs and, uh, and we made a promise to each other that we would get involved that we would uh, join join some clubs. Because you weren't having fun? We were having fun, but just with each other. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, I wasn't like this morose, dark, sure, unhappy person. sitting in a corner. No, not at all. We had great fun with each other, but we right. realized there was this whole school of people out there doing things. And all these opportunities, some of the, some of the kids got to go on school trips to places because they were in band, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we made a pact that we would join some clubs. And uh, the first thing we joined was drama. We joined the drama club. Okay. And uh, that'll throw you right into having to it be on will. stage. It will. I was always the backstage person. Oh, I was were the you? stage manager. Okay. I'm the organizer. All right. Uh, but anyway, at that point, you just sort of have this realization that a lot of being outgoing is socially learned behavior. Hey, how are you? It's good to see you. Yeah, how's your wife doing? You know, you kind of pick up these norms about how to interact with people, and when you smile, you look approachable, and, and probably everybody else in the room feels awkward and uncomfortable too, so why don't you just go over and say hello and start up a conversation? And you realize that's, that's learned behavior, and you can learn it, even as a young adult. You know what? I honestly don't think that a lot of people think about that. Mm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't think that a lot of people realize that it's learned behavior. Yeah. That's a pretty big observation for a kid in grade 9, grade 10. That's yeah. pretty impressive, you honestly. Know, I was at a conference recently with this woman, Jerry LeBlanc. She's a Mi'kmaq woman um, in Nova Scotia, a political activist back home. And she was talking about how she had to learn how to make eye contact. Because as a cultural thing, because yes. Of, okay. Because in, in where she's from, in in her culture, um, eye contact is not something you sustain, right? Like you might look at somebody in the eye, but you when you're talking, you kind of you don't have the sustained eye contact that that we do. Whereas um, for us, it's totally it's seen as an appropriate yeah, element and of contact. Appropriate and I mean, what's the step beyond that? Almost necessary yes. right and if you don't make eye contact then you're shifty or maybe you're hiding something yeah. or maybe you have low self-esteem right um, and and she she was telling a story about how she had to learn to make eye contact so that she could communicate effectively because if you're not if, if people are wondering are you shifty right <laughs> then or I don't listening. like that person yeah they're, they're not listening yeah and so when she said that that really resonated with me because of my attempts as a young adult to learn how to not be shy, to learn how to be social, to learn how to uh, communicate with people. Were you doing this entirely on your own, basically, with your friend Judith? I mean, <laughs> no, but like totally training yourself to be an outgoing. Yeah, or... well, it, it was a slow process, but I. Well, it was certainly an effective process. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. No. No, it's. It's uh, amazing to me. I was at this. I spoke at a conference last summer um, on public health, and there were thousands of people in the audience. And I'm sitting on this stage in sort of this Oprah-style couches, and we have these microphones. And there's these giant projecting screens where I'm, you know, 80 feet tall or something. And I was sitting up there, and I'm like, oh, well, actually, this is what I think about poverty and public health. And I had this moment where I thought, holy smokes! 
folks, how did this happen? There are thousands of people in the audience, and I used to like get, you know, get sick about doing public speaking in front of the 20 uh, kids in my class in grade six and, and bail on pu the public speaking uh, contest. When you um, told your family that you were considering running, how did they react? Do you want to hear a story about it? Yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> so I, my partner is doing his PhD at Carleton. Right. And he got into Carleton two years ago. And at, at the time when he got in, I said, I, I can't go with you. My career as a community legal worker, I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm really gaining some momentum. I'm not ready to go. But if you can defer for one year, I'll go to Ottawa with you. So he deferred. So I had one year knowing that I was leaving Halifax. I gave one year notice at my job. I gave one year notice at my apartment. And I started looking for work in Ottawa. Just calling around, like not, yeah. not serious, but just chatting with folks about what's going on here. So we're coming up to the spring of 08, and uh, Brendan, my partner, was at this um, rally in front of City Hall in Halifax, and Alexa McDonough was there, former MP for Halifax. And, uh, oh, Brendan, how are things? When are you guys going to Ottawa? And he says, oh, Alexa, you need to help me because Megan's moving to Ottawa for me. I don't want her to resent me if, if she's unhappy with a job. She loves her job here. I want her to be happy. If you hear of anything, can you let us know, you know, any, any good stuff coming up? And Alexa said, oh, I have a great idea. Why doesn't Megan move to, to Ottawa and be my legislative assistant? So <laughs> Brendan thought that would be great. And she said, look, no one's going to want this job because I'm not, I'm not going to run again. Oh, okay, sure. So she'd already right. announced she wasn't right. going to run again. Yeah. She said, no one's going to want the job because, yeah. you know, four months, two months, who knows. Right. But, you know, Megan could come. She could meet some people. Uh, get make to know contacts. Ottawa, make contacts. Right. Um, have so a paycheck. Have a paycheck. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I called Alexa and we had an interview and talked about the job and, and, uh, and talked about different possibilities. And this is moving into, um, actually this would have been probably June or July of last year. And then I, I called her eventually and said, Alexa, I'm, I'm not going to take the job. I'm gonna run. <laughs> really? Yeah. And she said, "Where?" No, she she knew. I mean, we. Yeah, it was. Uh, so she she knew that you were gonna. She she was wonderful because um, I don't know if you know the NDP process for for finding candidates, but when we need a candidate, there's a, a committee is struck that asks people to consider running people who are from historically. Uh, groups that are historically underrepresented in Parliament. Okay. So they freeze the process and they look for community leaders who are women, who are First Nations, gay, lesbian, Canadians, yes. youth, and they ask. Not one person, but they ask a lot of people to consider running. Which is obviously a highly effective strategy given that your party is very representative. Yeah, uh, well we're trying. The, certainly the gender. Yeah, and, um, we're trying. Yeah. And uh, so when that process was happening, um, Alexa did call and say, "Look, I think I think they're, they may be calling you to see to talk to you about running. And and if they do, I want you to know that you know you have my my support. Don't let this right. job get in the way, right? Like, let's take that off the table. Right. Um, which I thought was a really wonderful thing for for her. She's to do. a wonderful person. Though. She is. Yeah. She is. And so, did you? Um... Oh, so I didn't even tell you what my family thought because that was what your question was. Sorry. So I called my my dad. And I was like, oh, Dad, so I haven't talked to you in a while. Yes, yeah, like how long is a while? Because Probably a few weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, th I thought you might mean like 25 years or something. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> no, just maybe, maybe okay. a month. Okay. And, uh, and he said, so what, what's happening about Ottawa? Well, Dad, you know, and then Alexa, and then this job, and oh, would you be working on the Hill? Yeah, I'd be working on the Hill. Oh, Megan. Oh, Megan. That is what an honor. What an honor. I can't believe you'd be working with Alexa McDonough on Parliament. I'm just so, oh, it's such an honor. And he couldn't stop. He was so excited. And then I said, but Dad, I'm not taking the job. And uh, there was this dead silence. And then he says, what? <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to take the job. And he said, oh, Megan. Oh, oh, Megan, really, uh, you need to rethink that. Because this is, it's such a huge honor. You, I can't believe you're not going to take the job. You really need to rethink that. And I said, well, Dad, I'm going to run. I'm going to run to 
be the MP. Dead silence. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it was, for both my dad and my mom, a huge shock. Um, and it's also not something uh, that they ever would have imagined because we don't we don't sort of come from a political family at right. all, you know. Um, but that doesn't preclude you from being active. No, it doesn't. But it's just not a natural thing to think okay. about. You know, your mom's a nurse, maybe you'll become a nurse. Your dad's a probation officer, maybe you'll become a probation, probation officer. I never met a lawyer until I went to law school. Like, we sort of don't run in those circles, so yeah. to speak. And uh, it's just not, when I w decided to go to law school, my step-grandmother said, oh, I'm so excited you're going to become a police officer. <laughs> Right, because that's something we understand is yeah. law is police. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it just wasn't within the realm of the possible that I would do this. Did you feel unsupported no. because of it? No, no, okay. not at all. Okay. Uh, very, very supported, but they were just a bit baffled. How by it. long did it take for your dad to come around? Oh, it was pretty quick, and he came out and actually worked on my campaign. That's and, fantastic. But had never worked a campaign before. Had never, um, and I think had voted liberal. <laughs> Until now. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's a totally different world uh, for our family, to, for us to be involved in this. Have um, either of your parents come up to Ottawa to spend time with you? Have they been on the hill? My mom came for my swearing in. Yeah. Oh my gosh, she must have been so proud. Yeah, it, it and totally her out off. of her element. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it was very exciting. It was. I, I wish that I could get re-sworn in because the day of it was just so out of it and overwhelmed and um, I, I kind of don't remember it. It's like these little snapshots in my brain of yeah. it because uh, it was really a, an incredible thing to go through, to go through this election, then to be elected, then to come to Ottawa and it's really overwhelming. But uh, she came, my godmother came, my best friend came from, all from my hometown. and. Um, and it was wonderful that that's, they were here. That's really exciting. Yeah. Are you are you glad that you've done this? Yes. Yes. Uh, unhesitatingly, I will say yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Especially glad. Especially now that the first five months are over. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's an incredible thing to stand up in the House of Commons and to talk about your community. It is also an incredible thing to stand up in the House of Commons and speak the truth, the truth that you know about. Canada and about your communities and our and the truth about our country is very complicated right it's not all kittens and roses but unless we speak the truth about things nothing will change and you know I had this moment uh, maybe about a month ago where I stood up and I was talking specifically about um, about poverty uh, which is what my background is in and and I said something I was just I was just talking about the work that I used to do in Halifax and I, and I said something in my speech when, and you know in the House of Commons people are listening but they're also writing things they're yes. also flipping through papers and, and I said this thing and everybody stopped I saw them they stopped and they looked up the whole room they looked up and they looked at me and in my mind I'm thinking oh, did I just swear did I just cross the line <laughs> okay. should I not be saying these things what, what was it that you said I remember? was just talking about some of the impacts that I've seen of poverty okay. in my community right and and I, I continue my speech but I'm thinking I've crossed the line I've gone too far I've I've said something I shouldn't have said that and then a few minutes later through in my speech I'm still talking and I, I realized no no I was telling the truth I was telling the truth, and you should—you never cross the line when you're telling the truth. But sometimes we just don't want to hear the truth, or we don't want to acknowledge the truth. So it's a really incredible thing to be able to come to the House of Commons and to do that. What do you do to manage to relax? Because you have a pretty you have a job with a lot of pressure and I would imagine you put a lot of pressure on yourself too yeah what do you do to just decompress a bit I don't have breakfast meetings I always have breakfast with Brendan that's nice yeah. and uh, and we try not to read the paper over breakfast because then you're not paying attention to each other so you just talk yep we listen to the radio like uh, the internet radio so I can listen to the radio programming from home and we'll have that on in the background. Um, and we try every night to have a cup of tea or have a glass of wine and just, you know, even if I get home really late, uh, and I know sleep's important, but so is unwinding. 
Um, and, you know, you fit in little bits here and there, go for a bike ride together, or in the winter time here in Ottawa, we would go for a cross-country ski along the, along the river and um, just try and carve out little bits of time. For me, some of the most relaxing, uh, the way I relax best sometimes is through routine. Mm -hmm. So having, knowing that breakfast is sacred is really good. You know, knowing that I'm not going to come to the hill until 9. Right. Sometimes 8.30. <laughs> but 8.30 is not uh, that bad. I don't think that there's anything, no. there's nothing wrong with no, that. I don't think so either, especially when you're here until 10 at night. Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Um, is Brendan done his schooling here now? No, he, uh, he just finished his first year of his PhD in uh, climate change policy. So now he's starting to do research. Right. So he's doing a lot of reading. And does he go back to the riding with you, or does he mainly stay here? Um, maybe he comes back with me once a month, yeah. but he's coming back with me for the whole summer. His okay. parents are out there, his family's out there. Right. Um, it's just for the first year he needed to be closer to his professors, but sure. now he's a bit more freedom to travel with me, to travel back with me, which is great. Do you mind the traveling? Yes, very much I mind the traveling. Um, it's, I keep saying to people, I'm so lucky because I only have an hour and a half direct flight. Right one hour time difference, it's no problem, and I really hate it. Um, getting on a plane is, you're, I don't know if, if you remember what it was like to get on a plane and be excited about, oh, I'm going somewhere. Yeah. It's an adventure. I don't feel that when I get on a no, plane. No, I bet but you don't. It's fine. It's part of the job. I keep secretly hoping that we're going to move Parliament to Halifax. Yeah, do you think it's no, not doesn't, into, No, no, no one's talking soon. about that yet. I know. Bring but, it up. Yeah, I See should. See how far you get. should, yeah. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> we could have little harbor cruises at lunchtime. <laughs> That'd be and <laughs> fantastic. God, you could just have the best time yes, ever. Yes, yeah. It's fresh seafood. Oh yeah, all the time. Perfect, all the time. What's the most surprising thing that you have faced mm. on the hill in our last minute? Surprising. Uh, I I believe in our parliamentary democracy. I believe that the members of the House of Commons should be people who represent their communities. Um, and, and they are farmers, they are lawyers, they are uh, whitewater canoe instructors, they are the whole range of things. However, when I got here, I realized, wow, we're farmers and lawyers and whitewater canoe instructors, and maybe we're not experts on the Peru, Canada Free Trade Act. And maybe we're not experts on on renewable energy. And so it's been this very interesting thing to watch how I really believe that this is who should be making the decisions, but then at the same time I think, well, shouldn't we have the expertise. some expertise? And but that's what we rely on staff for, and that's what we rely on bringing witnesses to committee. So so it works, but I'm just, uh, the most surprising thing is the way I've had to really um, try and understand how it works. Uh, it, it's pretty, it's a beautiful thing when it works. Um, and so it's been really interesting to watch it and to try and, and, and to wrestle with understanding it. I really have enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you, it's I have as well. Breath of fresh air. Oh, really. you're and kind. I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you.